The situation in Ukraine is growing increasingly dire as Ukrainian soldiers struggle to maintain their defense lines against Russian aggression. So does that mean that the Russian president is edging closer to his goal of seizing large parts of Ukraine? If Putin believes he can simply wait out the conflict, he has miscalculated. Strong words from German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in support of Ukraine. However, they come at a time when his own party has emphasized the need to freeze the war. The question remains, of course, whose interests would this really serve? Ukraine's or perhaps Putin's? Today on To The Point, we ask, as Putin's troops gain ground, how will Germany and the West respond? Hello and welcome to To The Point. I'm Isha Bhatia San here in Berlin. And today my guests are Lieutenant General Ben Hodges. He is former Commanding General, United States Army Europe, and now Chairman of Globesec Future Security and Defense Council, FSDC. Next on the panel, we have Malte Lemming, Senior Editor of the Berlin-based newspaper, Der Tagesspiegel and Yulia Bidenko. She is Associate Professor at Karazin Kharkiv National University, Ukraine, and Visiting Researcher at the Center for East European and International Studies, ZOIS, in Berlin. A very warm welcome to you all. Yulia, let's start with you. Now, Ukraine is facing shortage of both weapons and soldiers. How long can they really sustain? Yeah, actually, it's a huge problem uh, because, uh, for example, I have a nephew in military forces uh, of Ukraine and uh, they are almost on a zero bottle line and they complain in that they even their unit needs a lot of ammunition now. So it's a huge problem. And the other problem that, for example, the eastern areas of Ukraine, like Kharkiv, my home city and my home region and Sumer region are under the constant shelling and attacks. and there are a lot of civilians who died and uh, who need to be evacuated. So it's a huge uh, challenge for Ukrainian, not only military, but also for, uh, let's say, officials who are uh, challenged uh, in humanitarian way as, as well. So there's constant shelling and they lack ammunition, they lack rockets, they lack air defense systems. What does that mean for their morale over there? Yeah, it's also a, a, a great problem because uh, people already about two years been uh, in a, in the battlefield. So uh, now Ukrainian parliament is working on uh, the new legislation to mobilize more people. And uh, they were kind of a, a, um, assessment that we need uh, 500 of thousand more. And uh, the morale, uh, not only inside the army, but uh, the uh, level of uh, uh, social cohesion is also decreasing now. So a lot of uh, surveys showing that it's uh, less trust to uh, official, less trust in Zelensky himself and people really getting tired. Even volunteers, even those who are on battlefields and those who are uh, living under the constant toll of the war. Ben, from a military point of view, what do you think? How long can the soldiers really hold their positions? Well, I think it's important to step back from the map a little bit and, and keep in mind that after 10 years of war, with Russia having every advantage, they still only control about 18% of Ukraine. Uh, the Russian Air Force has failed its two most important tasks, which is to gain total control of the air and also to interdict the logistics bringing ammunition from Poland into Ukraine. They haven't destroyed a single trainer convoy. Uh, one third of the Black Sea fleet is now underwater uh, and they're having to pull back from Sevastopol. Uh, the uh, Russian oil and gas infrastructure is being hammered uh, every week. Uh, almost 10 percent of it has already been hit. Uh, sanctions are having an effect on Russian rail. They can't get lubricants and spare parts. So so it's, it's too simple to just focus on Avdivka or trenches. And, 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 not folk, and not think about the broader strategic picture of where we are. We know from history that war is a test of will. Ukrainian soldiers have far superior will to Russian soldiers. There's no Russian that wants to be there. Uh, the, test, the real test now is logistics and 
who can win this uh, industrial competition? Can it Ukraine in the West or the Russians? I think we will eventually win this. You seem really optimistic. But what Ukraine really needs right now are also funds. And the $60 billion funds that uh, U.S. is not releasing, do you think that the Congress will manage to release it finally? So this is embarrassing to me that the United States is, is failing on a critical task here, especially when most of the Congress, including most Republicans, actually support Ukraine. Uh, most Americans support Ukraine. So this is being held up for domestic reasons by Mr. Trump, uh, uh, and Ukrainians are, are paying the price for it. I have to say that my president, who's done a good job otherwise, has got to do a better job of explaining to Americans why this matters to us. Go to the American people so that then they put pressure on their congressmen, say, wait, we, why aren't we helping Ukraine? So America is still discussing. Germany, meanwhile, has said another 500 million euros. Too little, too late? That's a good question. I mean, if, if it comes to, to total sums, Germany is the second biggest contributor for the Ukraine and uh, in military and in civilian assistance as well. So um, you can argue with the, with, the, with the amount of money that is given in relation to, to, your, uh, to the people you have or to the budget you have. So then it's in the middle ground, something like place 12 or something. I, I would not say it's too little too late. They, they are supporting uh, Ukraine, not to the extent it some, sometimes wishes. But, uh, but you have to see there, there, there's, a new, there's a new strategic tactic from the Ukrainian army. This is a, attacking the infrastructure of, a, um, of, of Russia in Russia itself, uh, oil refineries and things like that. So um, I think it should be supported in doing that because this detracts the attention from the Russians to many, many different places. They can't concentrate their air defense and defense systems on one place. So I think this is, uh, this is something to have to watch very carefully. And with limited resources at hand, the Ukrainian army is primarily focused on defending their positions against the Russian forces. This is becoming increasingly challenging as the odds stack up against them. Let's take a quick look at what the situation is like on the ground. Ukrainian soldiers in the Donetsk region are using Grad, a multiple rocket launcher from the Soviet era. There are a few grenades, but not enough of them. Not as much as at the beginning, when we could really fire and stop the enemy. In the east, things are looking bad for Ukraine on several fronts. Near Kharkiv, civilians are building more defences to prevent Russians from breaking through. Russia is also heavily bombarding the south. At least 20 people were killed in a recent attack in Odessa. These imperial ambitions will continue towards Lithuania, Latvia, and will not stop with France and Germany. It's better to stop it in Ukraine than later on a global scale. But Ukraine isn't just low on ammunition, it's low on soldiers, and the ones who have been fighting for two years are exhausted. Do Ukrainian troops still have a chance? Ben, your thoughts. Do they have a chance? Well, that was the most depressing uh, doomer narrative I've heard. And I don't think it accurately portrays what's going on. Of course they're building trenches outside of our, that which should have been happening years ago. Of course they're doing this. Uh, of course soldiers are tired. Clearly, Ukraine has got to uh, fix the personnel system. There, there are probably two million Ukrainian women and men that are military age. So uh, the government, not the army, the government has to do the job of changing the necessary law, but also convince women and men that if you come in the Ukrainian armed forces, we will not send you to the meat grinder and we will only put you in the right uniform, you'll get training, and then you'll be put in a unit so that you can do rotation. They've got to do that. But the, uh, you know, there's, there's another side in this war. There are no Russians that want to be there. And when we talk about Avdivka, I mean, people talk about Avdivka like it was Stalingrad. Avdivka <laughs> is as far in the east as you can possibly be in Ukraine. So there, 
And the Russians, after a month, I mean, that happened during Munich Security Conference. So a month ago, they finally took Avdivka after losing 40,000 soldiers, and they've only advanced one or two kilometers from there. So the Russians, I don't think, have the ability to exploit whatever success they are having. Let's bring in some data there. Now, Russia manages to produce 3 million units of artillery ammunitions annually, while the entire NATO alliance can only produce 1.2 million. That's less than half of what Russia is producing. So despite all the sanctions and everything, how is it that Russia is still able to maintain this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, obviously, there are holes in the sanctions. I mean, there are things that are still getting through from uh, India, China, Iran. North Korea, obviously. Uh, so... That's, that's a part of it. Um, but, you know, war is not a math problem. It's not like they made three, three times this. Uh, what matters is what capability you have where you need it. And if Germany, and, and so like a Taurus is equal to hundreds of artillery rounds. And, and with the precision or the U.S. attackums, the 300 kilometer attackums, every single Russian headquarters, artillery piece, logistics site in Russian occupied Ukraine, every one of them could be hit. That's, that's more important than how many thousands of artillery rounds they have. It's the precision would make such a difference. We'll come to Taurus in a bit. Yulia, European Commission has proposed transferring profits generated by frozen uh, Russian central bank assets to Ukraine. And um, Kremlin has said, and I quote, it, is, uh, it will be an unprecedented violation of international law. So how is Russia really going to respond if that were to happen? Well, actually, uh, it's uh, very popular among Russian politicians and diplomats saying about the violation of international law, occupying <laughs> well, they do the same. others' uh, <laughs> countries' territories, torturing people, uh, um, committing you know war crimes. <laughs> so, yeah, it is, uh, it is a point that is uh, actively advocated by Ukrainian, not only government, but experts as well, because uh, here are some assets which were frozen, but uh, the, the point that uh, uh, this might Money are still operated by the countries who throw them this uh, money. And Ukraine needs not only the uh, supplies of uh, ammunition, uh, there is a huge uh, demand of uh, nowadays reconstruction because we have like uh, 5 million of uh, internally displaced people. Uh, there are uh, people, more than 2 million of them lost their uh, ability to live in, in uh, the communities. So we need to repair uh, residential areas, we need to repair infrastructure, and it's a huge demand. The World Bank assessment, which was uh, which was released uh, like uh, on February, two months ago, uh, it was more than 453 billions of dollars which are needed to repair Ukraine. Right. And to put it in context, here we're talking about 2.5 to 3 billion euros per year. Which is nothing yeah. in comparison yeah, to what you... Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, but uh, from the other point of view, uh, uh, Ukraine facility already uh, kind of uh, developed as a plan from European Commission. And uh, uh, in Ukraine, there are now is a huge movement uh, uh, to develop uh, the plans and projects for reconstruction. So it's community-based reconstruction. It's reconstruction on building uh, back better. And now people, even, let's say, more or less, safe uh, regions, uh, the development, how to, you know, increase uh, the capacity to uh, give a humanitarian response if Russia still will be attacking and it will attack again and again. So it's obviously... Russia will attack again. And Malta, German Defence Minister Boris Pistorius, he recently emphasised that the West has to be prepared for any situation, he said. Now, we saw last week that Putin threatened uh, that there are nuclear weapons, and he said weapons are there to be used. So is the West really preparing for the worst at the moment? At least it seems they had prepared for it. Uh, there was a report in the New York Times back to, I think it was in, uh, uh, in the autumn, in the fall of uh, 22, when they really expected that the Russians would use uh, uh, nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Um, and they said the, the, the biggest problem might be Crimean, and they said the, the likability would be above 50%. Um, what strikes me in this report is that the answer would not have been nuclear, but conventional. 
This is something that the Russians read with, the, with, the, with a lot of attention because uh, it helps them their own calculation. Uh, that even though they might use atomic weapons, the West might not answer accordingly. So, um, so yes and no. Um, Putin is using the, the atomic threat as a, as a way to, to, to point to European countries, especially the Germans, because they are most afraid of them. Um, but if you're, if you're focused on the likability, then you can just raise the white flag and say, we give up. Um, and on the other hand, if you ignore the likability, that might lead to, to dangerous dynamics that, that you don't want to, want to have. So this is always, if you, if you fight a, sup, a nuclear superpower, that's, that's the dilemma you're in. So how do you think the West would respond? Because you said white flag. Now, uh, talking about, about Pistorius, I have his quote here and he says, nobody really knows whether or when Russia will attack anybody in Europe. So what we have to learn as allies in Europe is to be prepared for any threat, especially for a threat which comes from Putin's Russia in any year. Now, these are extremely strong words there. These are strong words. And I, I would say um, it makes a difference, for example, if you're a member of NATO or not. So NATO has to be prepared for any kind of threat against a NATO country because it's, a, it's, in, it's an alliance. Um, does that include every other country in that region? I would say no, uh, because NATO is, an attack on NATO is, is Article 5. Every other country has to, has to, has to come to help. Um, any kind of threat is, what do you think about threats? I mean, what can happen? Yes, sure. In principle, yes. But what does it mean in practice? I, I, I can't see that our defence minister is saying that. Moving on from defence minister, let's first take a quick look at what's really happening in Germany. So Chancellor Olaf Scholz had promised a Zeitenwender, a turning point, a historical shift in the country's uh, foreign and security policy in order to deal with Russia. Under Scholz, Germany has indeed become the second largest donor of weapons and ammunition to Ukraine right after the United States. But has Scholz really managed to keep his promise? Leaders from his own party, the SPD, are suggesting otherwise. Isn't it time that we not only talk about how to wage war, but also about how to freeze a war and end it later? Und später auch beenden kann. These suggestions made by the Chancellor's SPD party has triggered strong reactions and caused the Green Party Foreign Minister Baerbock to shake her head. She's referring to the UN report on Russian war crimes in Ukraine. I believe that anyone who reads this report will not bring up freezing the conflict again. This report reads like an absolute horror story. Then comes criticism from within the SPD. Defence Minister Pistorius agrees with his Polish colleague. What a freeze of the conflict, whatever form it would take, would mean it only helps Putin in the end. And Chancellor Scholz? Together with French President Macron and Polish Prime Minister Tusk, he has empathetically pledged to supply Ukraine with more weapons. How determined is Germany to support Ukraine? How do you see that, Ben? Won't freezing the war really mean that Putin gets to keep whatever he's occupied That's so far? exactly what it means. And bad luck for the millions of Ukrainians that are in the occupied territory, the thousands of Ukrainian children that have already been kidnapped and deported. Uh, we already know what happens in Ukrainian villages when the Red Army shows up, so bad luck for them. I, it's astounding to me that a senior German political official uh, would say something like this, which I think is strategically illiterate. Now, the problem is the United States and the German government have got to make it clear that we want Ukraine to win. I'm, I'm proud that the United States and Germany are the top two in terms of dollar or euro value, but that's, that's not the metric that matters. What matters is, have we declared what our objective is and how much progress have we made towards that Objective. It's, it's, not a, it's not a test of who gives the most. If that was the case, then uh, Estonia and uh, Lithuania would probably be right at the very top because of percentage of GDP. It's about giving what's needed to win. And that clarity, I think, is what's really missing. Well, what does winning mean? That the it's, Russians will just... 
pull out from any kind of occupied territory and say we give up, we surrender? No. If, if they do it that way, that'd be great. But the Ukrainians <laughs> have to eject them back to the 1991 border. That's that's President Zelensky has said that. Everybody recognizes that's the sovereign border. So the Chinese are watching to see, are we serious when we talk about sovereignty, human rights, respect for international law? Because if we fail here, where frankly it's much easier to support Ukraine than it will be out in the Indo-Pacific region, then I think the Chinese may make a terrible miscalculation the way the Russians did. But doesn't freeze mean that we... That uh, how long will you fight for this for this kind of end that well, that the that the Russians will pull out of every kind of occupied territory? Freeze means we postpone the end result and and talk about the stop of the war, postpone every kind of question. A absolutely, mm -hmm. the West can never give up the sovereignty of of Ukraine and everything like this, but try to find a settlement. Let's say a. We made NATO guarantees for the rest of Ukraine, but to have, and we'll settle all the other questions to a later point. So we wasted eight years with Minsk process. Um, so I don't know. I mean, this sounds to me like uh, Herr Munsnik didn't learn well, Minsk anything. Was, Minsk was not from the Minsk process. Yeah, I know, but Minsk was not for for NATO guarantees, security guarantees for Ukraine. Okay. Well, so you so Germany would be willing to actually. A, That's a an NATO? open question. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying trying to argue what what freeze might mean if you see it from the positive side. Well, uh, I, let I, me I, remind you here yeah, yeah. that we already tried to freeze the conflict, and after Crimea was occupied ten years ago, it's today when it was kind of uh, 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 annexed by a Russian Federation legally. So the uh, reaction of West was very, very weak. And Germany actually increased its consumption of uh, uh, gas from Russia twofold since 2014. And, uh, of course, uh, there were kind of a real um, attempts to freeze the conflict. And uh, during this time, Russia just regained its power and developed the uh, plan how to attack other territories of Ukraine. So it's really very uh, challenging to believe that uh, Russia will hold uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, points uh, that could be uh, reached during a negotiation. I don't believe this. But Yulia, we are also talking at a time where uh, leaders of EU are meeting in Brussels for a two-day summit. Do you think anything concrete will come out of that? Especially because it was just a few days back where leaders of the Weimar Triangle met each other. Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, I am a fan of uh, the European Union myself and uh, I cooperate with the EU delegation to Ukraine in teaching Ukrainian students, uh, students on uh, European studies. But we do understand that European Union is not about defense and uh, uh, this kind of um, assistance. So um, it would be nicer or it would be more clear for Ukrainians if uh, NATO members uh, will be more, let's say, uh, assertive uh, in their guarantees to Ukraine. That is why we could discuss whether there shall be any guarantees and uh, how to froze this conflict without any promises and uh, um, commitments from the NATO uh, member states. It will be no uh, point to talk about the frozen conflict, I think. I see here different uh, perspectives, also from Ben and Malta. And when the leaders of the Weimar Triangle, they met, although they tried to show unity, one could see there were differences there as well. Do you think the unity is really going to work there? Because Macron and Scholz are on completely different uh, tangents at the moment. They, they face very different, uh, uh, in their own country, mm -hmm. different dynamics. Um, in principle, I would say, um, Okay, Scholz is not saying we need troops on the ground. Uh, that what Macron suggested that might be a solution, uh, but but I'm not quite sure if even Macron thinks about that in realistic terms. So uh, France is now the only atomic uh, power in Europe since Great Britain pulled out. So it has a certain kind of leverage. Uh, that it can have a certain kind of power with their arguments. But I don't think there are, there are differences between Macron and, uh, and Scholz that, that go to the core of the problem. Uh, they both agree to support the Ukraine. Uh, France could do better, I think, uh, in supporting. Uh, Scholz can do better uh, <laughs> in other terms. But, but in principle, they are, they are in one boat. 
but you did start with um, domestic politics. So does that mean that for both France and Germany, domestic policy is actually shaping international and security policy at the moment? To a certain extent, yes. I mean, in, in, in Germany, the Ampel coalition, if, if the, the red, green and the uh, um, yellow coalition has very, very different uh, interests in this kind of thing. So a chancellor has to look for, for its own government and how to survive. So domestic policy, shaping international policy, that's all the time we have. Unfortunately, I know it was really quick. If you are watching us on YouTube, do let us know your thoughts. What do you think Germany and the West should be doing? Thanks for your time. Goodbye.